All right, so we're back. Uh, podcast bring on Dom and Andrea Perron, you know, uh, and we're cut short, you know, in the first part of the podcast because I was not looking at my timeline 45 minutes and uh, because I was so much into, uh, we were talking about the paranormal field evolving and how much, you know, is it has changed over the, the past 40 years. And uh, you were telling me about needing more people trying to further fill instead of creating their own mini, uh, you know, hip hypocrisies, you know, of faking stuff and uh, just to get on television or to get a TV show, which to me is a shame. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, it it diminishes everyone who's doing, uh, you know, in the eyes of the world, as it were. Uh, you know, when, when things like that come out and then it's proved that um, the evidence has been faked, it hurts all of us. It hurts the cause. Um, and uh, I really have no tolerance for that. And the thing is, there's... There's so much real evidence that's to be had, you know, with such relative ease that uh, to fake something just seems utterly counterproductive and totally lazy. Uh, exactly. A a exactly. And that's the thing about talked earlier about uh, the Warrens wanting to help uh, your family. Uh, it, it, okay, so you were there for 10 years, and the thing that I, I don't think I'm the only one who was a little bit not sure of the timeline of when they, they came into the picture to try to help you and your family. It, you know, was it like... We were in the there first from 1970. We lived there the first, uh, from the beginning of 1971 until June of 1980, uh, but we had had, you know, the place was already ours for all intents and purposes uh, prior to that. So really it was 10 years that, you know, from the time the farm came into our lives and then when we had to leave it. Um, and, you know, doing that really fractured our family, but we lived there for seven years after the... Uh, after the Warrens had already come and gone. Uh, they showed up at the house uh, unannounced and unexpected, um, and my mother graciously allowed them in, and she had no idea who they were. You know, she didn't go looking for anyone, not for anybody. She didn't call for anyone to help her with the house. Um, she didn't know there were paranormal investigative teams. You know what I mean? We were uh, completely blindsided by this. We thought we were moving into a, you know, one of the original colonial homes in America, and oh my God, the history of it. You know, that's what our focus was on. And for, as kids, 200 acres of our own perfect park to play in, and horses, and you know, I mean, it, it was heaven. It was heaven, but there were, um, there were times that it was hell. And um, when the Warrens came, uh, it was on the eve of Halloween. It wasn't Halloween proper. It was the night before. It was around 6.30 or 7 o'clock, just after, um, after dark. They couldn't find the place right away. They drove past it three or four times because it's so tucked in off the road. And when they came to the door, my mother let them in, and they explained who they were. Uh, and Keith Johnson had told them about our plight. And we still, to this day, don't understand how he ended up showing up at our house. He said that my mom called him and said she had a problem. And my mom said, I never called anybody ever. You know, so we still haven't figured that out. We don't know if that was the first uh, manifestation. You know, spirits are perfectly capable of throwing their uh, voices, perfectly capable of uh, um, manipulating a person My in God. ways that uh, are absolutely untenable. Um, and we don't even know if that was a manifestation of that or not, and we never will. But uh, anyway, Keith is the one that informed the Warrens, and he told them in August of uh, 1973, right after he had come to the farm and had some pretty significant experiences there himself, um, most of which, all of which is documented in an interview that I did with him that's also on YouTube at my uncle's house in Lincoln, Rhode Island. Um, so anyway, uh, they were gone as of August, July or August of 1974. They came several times um, and interviewed, Ed interviewed us, the five kids. Uh, Lorraine spent most of her time with my mother uh, and my father made sure that whenever they were around, he wasn't. 
Oh, okay. That you see, that's another part of the the, the movie that we, we get around because it almost seems like a a brotherhood was formed between your father and uh, yeah. Ed. And that's the power of Hollywood, and that's the power of script writers, you know. And yet, I'll tell you, Dominic, there were things in that film that were cosmic kisses. There were things in that film that told me from the first time I saw it, uh, Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema um, kindly invited me, uh, along with Mrs. Warren, uh, out to California to uh, have a private screening of the film three months before it actually went out into the world. And we sat there and cried and cried and cried. There were so many elements of that film, things that they knew absolutely nothing about that somehow made their way into the movie. And that's what tells me from the cosmos, no matter how wrong they got it, ultimately they got it right because they told the story in broad, sweeping strokes and tried to be as true to it as they could. They were trying to get a PG rating. They still didn't get it. They were trying to tone down the original story to such an extent that it would be palpable and would not run people out of the theater. And that's how they came up with The Conjuring. But there are several things. For instance, there are over 25,000 patterns, existing patterns of wallpaper. They chose the one pattern that we had in the farmhouse, and they never saw any photographs of the inside of the farmhouse. So it was not that um, the set designer matched it. Something told her that's the one, and she used that for the recreation in the house that they used. Um, uh, in my bedroom, uh, as the camera rounds the corner going into my bedroom, Shanley Caswell's bedroom in the film, there's a picture of, um, up on the mantel board of a white folk art cat. I have that. That was a paint-by-number thing that I fell in love with at a flea market for 50 cents when I was a little kid. And my mother's friend, we were living at the farm, and my mother's friend, Fran, bought it for me and gave it to me when I was like 12, 13 years old. That's, and they oh had God. no idea that that was a precious keepsake from the farm for me. They had no idea. And there it was appearing in the film. There's the scene right at the beginning where Cindy's running through the house with wind chimes to go hang them on the porch. We had a virtually an identical set of those wind chimes hanging on our front porch. And mm -hmm. on and on. I never wrote about the fact that my dog got killed within days of us moving into the farm. I thought it would be too sad and too morose and almost unbelievable that our dog was killed as soon as we moved to the farm. So, uh, that, so that, that part was, uh, was true, you know, the dog is so sad, you know? Yeah, and, you know, he, he died in my arms. It was uh, a very traumatic experience in my life. And because of, you know, the first 40 or 50 pages of volume one, we're not even at the farm yet. It's, it, it introduces you to our family, uh, the dynamic of our family, where we lived at the time, how life was, uh, all the, the principles involved, our closest friends, uh, and then gradually you see that all of the series of unfortunate events that occurred uh, while we were living in Cumberland are what conspired to convince my mother to find another place for us to live. And that's what catapulted us to the farm, which is why, you know, people read the, the first opening of the book and they're like, um, this, I don't think this is a haunted house. Well, no, because it wasn't. We were living in a little eight-room Cape Cod in uh, Cumberland, Rhode Island. And a number of things occurred, a number of events occurred that had to, and sometimes very sadly, happen exactly the way that they did for us to be compelled to leave. My goodness. And so the Warrens, they, they investigated about five or six times in, in your home during that span? A couple of times they just came by themselves. Okay. And then um, they started bringing more and more people with them. And you know in the film how it's represented that there was uh, a possession and that there was an exorcism? None yep. of that happened. 
none of that. That whole entire scene is completely fictionalized. It comes from the minds of uh, the screenwriters, Chad and Carrie Hayes. Um, what actually happened blew their minds so much they didn't even think that it could be recreated. And so what we ended up with is how they represented it in the film. My God. My God. My mother was not possessed. My mother was attacked. If my mother was technically possessed, it was for a very short amount of time. But what it appeared to me to be was an attack uh, that came and literally took over her body for a short period of time, spoke through her, spoke through her in a language that does not exist on this planet. Um, I don't know if it was uh, demonic, if it was extraterrestrial, what it was. We still don't know what it was. You never hear me talk about demons. I don't know what a demon is. I do not know what a demon is. Uh, you know, it seems like in the same way that God has a different um, definition for every mortal soul, I think that Satan and demon does as well. Um, and really what it signifies is the, the loving, um, good, benevolent side of nature and, and in opposition, uh, according to the laws of duality, the uh, oppressive, negative, evil side of uh, humanity and behavior and what exists in the world. Good and evil exists in the world. It's how we distinguish one from the other. You're right. You're totally right. And th that's incredible to think about, uh, you know, the will that he had to stay there and fight through this. Because I had on my podcast a few uh, months ago, Mr. Bob Cramner. I don't know if you've heard the story, um, you, what he ha happened to him in, in, in New York, in, um, in Pittsburgh. And uh, the, the book is called The Demon of Brownsville Road. And he stayed there for a few years. And uh, while the, the whole battle took place, and uh, he was fighting with... You know, that very bad entity that was staying in his home and uh, he fought and he fought and he had a lot of people saying, why did you put your family at risk and you stayed there? Kind of like in the same way your family did, you know, you, you just don't run away from, from from this. A lot of people would, but to me, it's a sign of, you know, a strong will and uh, of love and unity that you're able to all fight through it together and say, you know what, this is our home. And like you said, you know, there's, of course, bad things happening but at the same time you feel compelled to this home you, you, there's a you know a connection to the home that you uh, that is almost impossible to uh, to describe yeah and it's almost impossible to break and I'll tell you when we left the farmhouse the reason that we did was um, the spring uh, prior to leaving or the winter prior to leaving my mother approached my father and she said Roger I will not survive another winter in this house And uh, when spring came, they put the house on the market, and it languished, and it languished, and no one even called to look at it. Um, and then my father, um, my mother had a, a blowout with the spirits, uh, which is the chapter in the third volume, Go in Peace. Uh, and it was a real blowout. It was a big wind. Uh, and... Um, And then my father went to the abutting landowner and cut him a very sweet deal on the property. And my sister Nancy was so distraught that our home was being sold that she approached the, the new owners herself and offered to stay on as the caretaker um, because they were not in any way prepared to move from the house they were in. They just wanted the property. And so Nancy stayed on for months afterwards and it effectively flat fractured our family. Uh, by the time that I graduated from college in May um, and went back to the farm, Cindy had already moved with the horses and was setting up housekeeping at the new property down in Georgia. Um, and Nancy was staying behind. So we never lived all together under the same roof again. Um, and I mean, even to this day, there are those in our family that mourn the loss of that farm. Half of us never wanted to leave it, and half of us never wanted to go back. Exactly, exactly. But you, I, I was it the first time you, you came back into the house years later. Uh, did you feel the energy was different? No, 
I felt it immediately. I felt completely, utterly at home. I felt uh, the existence of every spirit in the house. Uh, I felt like I was where I belonged um, and where I've always felt like I belonged. It is literally the only place that I've ever been on this planet that feels like I belong there. Wow. So it must be very emotional for you, you know, when you, you when you go back and you pull in the driveway and you see you feel like this is your home. Yeah, yeah, and I have, and I did for many years, um, and it was very difficult for me. You know, after the film came out, uh, the current owner of the house did a 180 on all subject supernatural and went so far as to say that. Um, Our family had made the whole story up and that nothing was happening in that house, that nothing had ever happened in that house, um, which, you know, there's, you, you can't change horses in the middle of a stream and expect not to get wet. There are hours and hours and hours of video footage of her out on the Internet talking about all the experiences that she had. She invited numerous paranormal investigative teams to the house over decades that she lived there, uh, including the ghost hunters for season two, episode seven, uh, the Sutcliffe investigation. Uh, it is out there. It's out in the world for people to see. So everything that, and they, they really did capture some great evidence. I have to give them credit. Um, and, you know, it, it just seems to me, uh, I know too many people that have investigated in that house. I'm very close friends with John Zaffis. Uh, you know, I know, uh, I know so many of the people, Ken DaCosta. Uh, and Rise Up Paranormal, oh, yeah. Keith Johnson, and yeah. Near Paranormal, whole groups of people who have had very profound experiences and have captured a great deal of audio and video evidence over the years in that house. There is no denying that that house is as haunted as it ever was. I didn't know that Ken, because I'm good friends with Ken DaCosta, and I didn't know Ken had been there, so that's going to be something I'm going to talk with him in our next podcast, because uh, Ken is... Uh, Ken like the father figure that for me in the paranormal field you know like John Zaffis I've met John a few times but I never had the uh, the chance to investigate with John but to me my first big investigation was in Rhode Island in Payne House in Coventry and uh, it was with Ken and uh, it was just a moment for me to just shut up and just listen and watch <laughs> watch him go yeah he is an amazing amazing man um, he's absolutely brilliant And he's such a compassionate investigator. You know, that's where I learned. A lot of people are saying that about me. I'm very compassionate with the spirits when I investigate. But you know what? I learned it from from Ken and uh, with a spirit uh, in that pain house called uh, Sarah Elizabeth. And the way they protect her and the way they interact with her, to me, was uh, it's emotional even to talk about it. And not only Ken, but his whole team, Rise Up Paranormal and Taps Home Team, you know, like David, David, and uh, it, uh, amazing team, amazing team. You know, th this is what paranormal is all about to me when you talk about Ken and Keith Johnson because I've investigated with Carl his brother and uh, to me th this is the salt of the earth you know this this is what real paranormal investigators are are you know trying to help people not just to post cool videos or to update the website or sell more t-shirts like you said before yeah it is um, you know I am associated with really the very best of the best people in the paranormal You know, I am so graced and honored to call Rosemary Ellen Guiley my friend. You know, I mean, <laughs> wow. You know, she is the preeminent scholar in the field. Uh, with no competition. Um, you know, Ken, I don't know if you know this, but Ken DaCosta uh, is writing a book and is uh, documenting. He's an absolutely excellent writer, uh, and he's never done this before, and I've been encouraging him for the last few years now, you know, to start putting it down, put it down, put it down, uh, and he's doing it now, um, so I'm very excited, and I, you know, reach around and pat myself on the back for giving him a kick in the butt, because he's just too talented um, and too multidimensional himself in terms of what he does. His ability to uh, solicit the spirits in a loving way produces more evidence than any other approach and I tell people all the time do not provoke the spirits show some respect 
that was their house long before we were ever there and will continue to be long after we're gone. So it really is a matter of showing, uh, you know, more than a modicum of respect for uh, those that came before us. It's not only respect for the dead, it's respect for the existence of spirit itself. Exactly. I totally agree with you. And, you know, it's a life-changing experience when you get to investigate with pro, uh, pros like that and you see them interact. It's not just the usual questions of why are you here or why did you do this or whatever. It almost fe feels to me like 90% of paranormal investigations, it, it's almost like uh, police interrogations. I don't know if you, you have the same feeling to me, but it's always why, why very... Uh, almost like you, you, if somebody was to knock on my door right now and start talking to me like that, I would slam the door in their face. I wouldn't answer questions as, why are you here? Why do you live here? The, you know, instead of saying, talking casually. And like Ken says to me all the time, you know, if you talk to them the same way we do when we have a cup of coffee or drink a beer, you know, just talk about whatever you, you love to do and try to find something they love. If you know there's a place, you know, they had a piano, maybe talk about music, talk about, you know, It's, uh, yeah, you get more chances to get more interaction that way than just being like, uh, almost like a detective. Yeah, and you know, I'm so glad that you got to work with him in Pain House, too. Pain House is very, very active. Uh, the last time we were there, I didn't even participate in uh, the investigation, but uh, George and, um, and Ken went in uh, with their uh, a small group uh, from Rise Up, and they got disembodied voices. Wow. They were spoken to directly. Uh, the amount of energy that it takes to generate a disembodied voice is really phenomenal. So for them to be able to tap in to our frequency and tune into our wavelength for it to sound so clear, it is as if they are standing in the room. That is an amazing, amazing thing. That's incredible because to me, over the years, it happened to me only twice, this embodied voice. And last time was two weeks ago at the Allen Mansion in North Adams. And uh, I didn't even realize that back then we thought we heard a cat. <laughs> it's back home. You know, but a lot of times, you know, it's only when you get, you, you get back home and you review your stuff that you catch 90% of the, uh, the things that you had. And uh, what we thought was a cat was a little girl screaming. And to me, it was a game-changing experience also because, like you said, you know, uh, disembodied voices are very rare. Yeah, it is. It's very rare, and it requires an inordinate amount of energy. Uh, and, you know, that's really the thing, Dom. We're, we're all energy. We are all essentially spirit. We're having a mortal experience now. We're here to learn things. Uh, this is a really huge classroom. And... We were, in my opinion, uh, as, as blessed as we were cursed to be at the farm. Um, it was uh, a truly incredible experience. And, you know, in terms of The Conjuring, in terms of making the film, if they were to have told the whole truth about what happened in that house, people would have found it literally unbelievable. This is a, a case, a classic case, where the truth is stranger than fiction. Right. And in order to, to say that it was based on the truth, they felt they had to fictionalize it. They toned that screenplay down so many times from, from the original, from what uh, Chad and Carrie Hayes wanted to use of the material. Um, They were absolutely stunned by it, and they thought that it would run people out of the theater, and they wanted to get a PG-13 rating on the film and turned it into a summer blockbuster, which they did anyway, even with an R rating. Um, you know, but it really only tells a little bit of the story. It tells the story in broad, sweeping strokes. Good conquers evil, love conquers fear. The Perrin family had an extreme haunting Uh, and, you know, the fact is they did not represent the Warrens um, the way that it happened because that would have, uh, by some perceptions, been a bad reflection on them. And this film was meant to highlight not their careers, not to show them any disrespect at all. Um, that was the intention behind it, and I completely agree with that. They were in over their heads from the moment they stepped over the threshold. Anyone would have been. You know, if we don't know what's going on in that house and still can't put our fingers on the pulse 
of the supernatural, if we don't know the truth of the mysteries behind what happened in that house, nobody does. Nobody, including the Warrens. And Ed would readily admit that, and so will Lorraine. We don't know. When we're talking in a spirit box and we're getting answers, we don't know precisely who we are talking to. That's so true, because, you know, we could be talking to a spirit. Can it, can it be, uh, you know, you know, just paranoia? It's it's really hard to say other, other than mention. There's so many layers of the paranormal field that we don't understand that we probably will maybe 20 years from now, but that's by keeping on investigating and right. try to document everything we can and try to understand, like orbs 20 years ago, you know, uh, you would see dust on any picture. Yeah, here, here, here you go. This is a, a ghost. And now we, we know that 90% of the time it's dust. And um, what we perceive now with electromagnetic field with the, the K2 meter or whatever, maybe years from now we'll be able to explain it, that maybe it's a ghost. Maybe it's not, but, you know, we keep, at least, you know, we're trying. And we're trying to, to help also at the same time. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we all must remember that all accepted science began as pseudoscience. All of it. You know, all of it was an idea. Thoughts are things. And when we have a thought and then we manifest it in, you know, through our creative energy into a reality, whether it be building a table or coming up with a new hypothesis, It's all the same thing. I mean, even scientists have faith, whether it's in, you know, having faith that there is no divine creative being, if that's their faith, if their faith is, is in pure, unadulterated science uh, with no creator involved, uh, you know, just the science of mathematics, the universal law of the, you know, and language of, the, of uh, all that we know and all we can perceive, um, There's, there's so much to think about. There's so much here to delve into, not only the philosophy, the theology, the quantum mechanics. The, you know, I think that ultimately a lot of our answers will come through science, uh, and that is why uh, I encourage people who are doing their work uh, you know, with techno technical devices, with electronic devices, who are trying to tweak them, um, such as with the spirit box, to get to a frequency, wouldn't it be absolutely amazing if we could create a device where we could literally talk directly with anyone that we wanted to who had passed away? How would that universally transform mankind on the planet? I think that it would be extraordinary. Uh, in much the same way that I demand disclosure from the government regarding information around uh, extraterrestrial existence, Uh, I likewise demand from within uh, the paranormal field that we keep doing what we're doing, that we move forward, that we do everything in our power to prove what we already know. Because once the door of spirit is kicked wide open, you can't ever shut it again. Once you are touched by spirit, that's it. You can, you can pretend that it didn't happen. You can turn your back on it and say, I want nothing to do with this. But every now and then, it will tap you on the shoulder and let you know it is absolutely there. It is part of your existence. We live in a multidimensional, multisensory universe. And we try so desperately to live on a three-dimensional, five-sensory planet in a plane of action that is not the whole truth of our existence, not by a long shot. It's just a tiny fraction of who and what we are in the universe. So I, I look at it, um, I guess, in very uh, broad ways. I look at it as... Uh, We're just learning about who we are, and perhaps it is true that we are each a living embodiment, a manifestation of God consciousness, and perhaps it is through our eyes that God sees this world. Exactly, and when you were talking about the, um, you know, what if we are the ghosts? <laughs> you know, I yeah. remember watching the movie The Others with Nicole yeah. Kidman, and uh, at the end of the movie, you realize that they are the one. You know, they're they're the ghosts. You know, in the house, all throughout the movie, you think the house is, uh, you know, that there's something going on, paranormal activity. And you realize that they are the one. You know, they're 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 gone, and they protect the house, and it just you know gave a new new spin like different perspective of looking at it like you know what if they never left and to them this is their home and people 
you know, sometimes, you know, maybe some are more receptive. Maybe your family was more receptive to uh, to them. And um, was it the fact there was a large number of people coming in? Like, you know, eight people, eight new people coming in. I always find it the same way when you go investigate. When I investigate by myself and I go investigate with uh, a whole team or an event, you know, there's a 20 people. It's not the same thing. It's not. I always get better results with just a small team or just yeah. just by myself. Than yeah, when there's I do too. And I get better results when I'm just working with George. Uh, we did a we did a spirit box session though that was very very productive uh, at Bathsheba to Sherman's gravestone um, in July. Uh, we were up there for uh, Ken's event. Ken DeCosta and, and Rise Up Paranormal sponsored the Ocean State Paracon right in Harrisville, downtown Harrisville, and the farm is located on the outskirts of town. Um, and we had a uh, an event. Uh, after the event um, that Saturday night uh, from the Paracon, we went to the Gravestone and we had uh, some of the preeminent um, investigators with us, including um, we had Keith uh, Johnson, we had Ken DaCosta, Joe Chin, John Zaffis, George, of course, myself, my father was there, and several other people as well. Uh, it was very active. We got some, uh, George was blown away uh, in review uh, by what, a lot of it we caught directly, um, and you'll hear that in the video clips uh, where George says tag, tag. Uh, we even went so far as to uh, make direct contact with Bathsheba and ask her if she could identify um, the children that were buried beside her, and she did. My God, because we have to, for people who didn't listen to the first part of the podcast, uh, in the movie, she's portrayed as the e evil entity p possessing your mother. And in real life, you know, uh, you know what you're saying is that she was one of many spirits that was in the house. And a lot of things were, were said, and a lot of things are hearsay, you know, that she killed her children and stuff like that. And none of it is fact, uh, are facts, you know, it's like more like, um, you know, hearsay <laughs> from people. And so to, what kind of response, what, what was the question you asked and what kind of response did you get from her? Uh, well, George put all of the clips um, that uh, I okayed. Uh, you know, if, if we asked some, I asked her some personal questions as well and we didn't put those up. Um, but he does his spirit box sessions uh, in a very methodical way. Uh, and you'll hear that when you listen to the clips and he'll also... Um, add on to each uh, mp3 clip is um, uh, the words not only do you hear it first but then he puts the words down in later that he extracts and there are literally hundreds of them wow. um, and it's on our YouTube channel A World Awakening and it's also on our Facebook channel A World Awakening That's absolutely incredible because, you know, to me, you know, if there's one misunderstood, misunderstood spirits in, uh, in this world, it's, it has to be her. And uh, I just saw a video of the tombstone, you know, broken in half. And I, I, I can't help but feel like um, there's a lot of reasons for uh, if she didn't do anything wrong. You know, there's a lot of stuff put on her that what if, you know, she didn't do all of these things? What if she's, you know, innocent? And uh, that's the best example. A lot of people taking, oh, my God, I saw in the movie, so it must be right. She's that evil spirit or whatever. And so uh, it, it's... Well, you will find in my books that I am her great defender. Uh, you know, there is no proof anywhere that she murdered the baby in her care, that she sacrificed the infant um, as she was accused of. Um, it never even went to trial. There was only an inquest, and she was absolved of guilt um, before it ever went to trial. Uh, and there is no explaining how a needle ended up impaled in th at the base of an infant's skull that was in her care. Um, however, the, in the court of public opinion, she was tried and convicted, and she spent a miserable life being accused of something that she may not have done. It may have just been a tragic accident. The child may have fallen back into a sewing basket, for all we know. There is no telling. Um, what exactly happened, but if, you know, she's going to be accused of this for eternity, I thought that someone should step up and try to tell her story 
as fairly as possible with um, all uh, what little uh, I had at my disposal in terms of uh, the record of her life. Uh, you know, it just seems to me that we all deserve the benefit of the doubt. I totally agree. This is exactly my, my view of the, about the paranormal. And that's the reason why I think we do what we do is to get, to give the voiceless a, a voice, you know, because yeah. they, uh, and, and to give them a chance to maybe come forward and say things that they, they never had a chance to say while they were alive. And uh, a good example would be, I would love to go investigate Lizzie Borden with you uh, or any place that uh, people think like the Villas Camerda house or uh, all these places where people go sometimes with already the notion, oh, this is what happened. What if it didn't happen? And if it did, you know, try to go take a different route, you know, to get answers or to help. And if, you know, the spirit is still there trapped and feeling guilty. And you're going out there provoking, you're making things not only worse for the spirit itself, but for everybody that, you know, either still live there or ev any other spirit that may might be trapped also with, with you know. So this provoking to me is the last thing you should do on any investigation. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Absolutely. And unfortunately, there are many uh, different uh, programs and Uh, different people out there who are uh, putting themselves out into the community, um, you know, and videotaping things and doing absurd things. And, you know, I have my issues, too, with, you know, some of the women in the paranormal who, uh, you know, think that the only way that they can get any notice is to, you know, be as blatantly sexy as possible, uh, you know, to sexy up something that is, you know, actual, uh, supposedly actual serious research. Uh, and, you know, and I've been very vocal about that because I think that not only do they reflect very badly on themselves, but they reflect badly on all women who are trying to approach this work very seriously. And we bring to this um, something different. We do. Um, but that is really in terms of our instinct and our intuition and our sensitivities and our sensibilities. Now, it really should be about that and not anything else. Um, you know, so that's something that I have addressed repeatedly, and I'm sure as you go around listening to different interviews that I've done, you'll hear me be very verbal on the subject uh, because I find it very offensive. And I think that not only is it extremely counterproductive for women in the paranormal, uh, I think it's just extremely counterproductive for women in general. You know, maybe we'll stop being treated like sexual objects when we stop acting like them. Exactly. And also the fact that, you know, this is... At one point, you have to stop and ask yourself the question, why am I doing this? You know, am I doing this just for the thrill? Because there's so many teams coming up, and the first thing you look out, there's a, you know, either YouTube channel or website never investigated in their lives. And the first thing they realize is most of the time it's long nights with nothing happening. Right. And sometimes for one or two EVPs, you know, you're there for eight, nine, ten hours, and you get 20 more hours at home to rewatch everything. But to me, it's the private home investigations that keeps me going. Of course, I love to go to Bobby Mackey or like this weekend, May Rolling Hills or all these places. That's cool. That's This is the... Um, You know, cherry on the cake. But to me, the real deal is doing private home investigations. Like, I have one coming up soon, you know, where the uh, the owners are very frightened. They, they're about to sell the house. They're they're afraid, and they think they're crazy. And I, I told them, you know, you're not. <laughs> Because, my God, there's so uh, many places, you know, where there's paranormal activity that you have no idea. So you're not crazy, you know, and we're going to try to help you. And, uh, you, you know, in my humble way because I'm no that, that's the thing you know there are like, no experts all we can do is try to help each other that's all we can do because there are no experts in the field yep I totally agree Andrea what you're saying there's no expect who, who are we to say oh yeah I'm gonna come up and clean the place okay the spirit is gone who am I who am I to say that you know I could try to appease it to, to talk to it and to try to make it understand that you know maybe they're scaring the people in the in the home that they're welcome to stay but please try to scare people in whatever but who am I to say okay now they're gone you know they're where are they <laughs> they're gone where you know who am I to say that you know right When there's no proof to back it up, it's well, easy to I say. Uh, any But you have aligned yourself with some of the very best of the best in the paranormal.
paranormal world. Uh, people that have done this for decades and decades, people that have been touched by spirit, you will find that virtually everyone that you've mentioned um, had their first paranormal experience as children and that they felt compelled to follow this line of investigation lifelong. Um, these are the people that I take seriously, not the ones that decide because they watched an episode of Ghost Hunters that they too can be the next Ghost Hunters um, and, you know, make themselves some YouTube videos and fake some, uh, some evidence and try to get themselves out into the public eye that is uh, destructive to what we're doing. Um, and there's no stopping it. Uh, only the people that buy them or represent them um, can actually be the ones who say no more of this uh, and not give them those contracts and go after someone who's doing something much, you know, something much more serious. Uh, and this is serious. I can't think of anything more serious other than, uh, you know, obviously the extraterrestrial issue, which needs to be addressed in a big way. That's my latest thing. I just came back from uh, lecturing at uh, the Starworks Symposium out in Laughlin, Nevada this wow. past weekend, and I was with PhDs from all around the world. I was with people who have been uh, in pursuit of uh, answers to hardcore questions for many decades, uh, and I found it truly inspiring, and I found it to be, uh, uh, you know, a lot of like-minded individuals who are all working in single-minded purpose towards a well-defined goal, uh, and so I really appreciated having that. But again, this all falls under the umbrella of the paranormal, the unknown, the unexplained. Exactly. I totally agree. Because UFOs is also a big subject of mine. My good friend Antonio Paris of Aerial Phenomena, Ben Anson, are very great. That, that could be the subject of our ne next podcast together. I would love to have you on because there's only three minutes left. <laughs> Time flies so fast. It's incredible. And I wanted to keep one question for last, uh, Andrea. If you had one advice for someone who is going through paranormal activity in their home, they're scared and they don't know what to do. What advice would you give them? I can only tell them what I did. And what I did was I embraced the fear. I embraced wow. it. I understood that it was part of who I was, that I was seeing something new and unusual, that the natural reaction to that would be fearful. But if they don't feel an actual threat by what's going on in the house, then I would say allow yourself the opportunity to experience it, and it will change the way you think about everything for the rest of your life. You know, embrace the fear. I think it's going to be, become, a, that, that's incredible, you know, that's a wonderful way to, to put it together, is to, don't be afraid to be afraid. Don't be afraid to be afraid, and you'll be amazed how fast the fear dissipates, and then all of a sudden you're on an entirely different level of comprehension. That's so true. You know, that's le leaving me speechless <laughs> because that's that that basically sums up what we do in the paranormal field. Yes, it is. It does. And once you've you've reached that point where you're, uh, it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to. Uh, th there's nothing that can stop you from moving forward and uh, try to uh, because I, I've often said you know when I started investigating I would watch a horror movie when I was younger and I would sleep in my mom's room for a week and uh, I remember watching The Ring and being a, seeing my TV and being scared to see that thing coming out of the tele television screen and now I, I investigate and you know what nothing scares me I don't know the fear is gone I woke up one more I always said one morning I woke up and the fear was gone so I must have embraced it along the way <laughs> your heart and I would be happy to join you again anytime Dominic you are absolutely lovely man and I look forward to meeting you and hope that uh, this summer we can do an investigation together at Rolling Hills oh my goodness that'd be incredible or uh, Rhode Island is a place I go every every summer this is my my I always call Rhode Island my home away from home I have a lot of friends in Massachusetts and most of my teammates are there you know uh, Mark and Lauren and Mike so uh, we have to find a place to investigate and team up together and it would be an honor for me to uh, investigate with you uh, ma'am it was an honor to have you on my podcast really really happy we had a chance to talk and uh, this is the first of many to come yes it is thank you very much for having me and bless you and all of your listeners thank you very much 
Have a great day, honey. You, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. So thank you, everyone, for listening to, uh, you know, to me, my uh, sweetest podcast I ever had. So uh, I, I'll be back in two weeks. I'll, I'll be gone for a week. So uh,